Deaf and dumb. Now that's a relic from the past. Or is it? Is this an image? Is this a description? Is it a label? Is it an expression? When I was very young and out with my family, I heard these words describing us. I am the only um, hearing person in my immediate family. My <clears throat> parents and my brother are profoundly deaf. And until I was two, we lived at the Utah School for the Deaf. So I was around lots of hearing and deaf people. My parents were teachers there. They had grown up from kindergarten to, through high school in that school. They went to Gallaudet College in Washington, D.C., and then after graduation returned to begin their teaching careers at that school. Now, my parents could speak very well, which is totally counter to something I heard years later, which was, Anyone who signs will never learn to talk. Now, I know from my own experiences with my family and many other deaf people that that is not true, that it's a biased comment or it shows a total misconception towards sign language and towards those who are deaf. So back to my parents. They could speak very well. Their voices had characteristics of tonality and flow and rhythm that were a little different. But everybody who communicated with them, hearing people who talked with them, no one had any difficulty understanding them. Their command of English was superb, absolutely superb. Their lipping skills were amazing. My dad once. Um, explained lip reading to me as constantly putting a puzzle together, which is fascinating when you think about that. He said, you go for the content words and keep in mind the context of the conversation, and then you fill in with your knowledge of sentence structure, you fill in all the other words. But he cautioned, he said, you could, if you miss one word, misunderstand it, or just miss the word, you may, go, you may be going down this path of communication, understanding, while the real communication is going down another path. So it's very difficult. Now, that was in the era before interpreters, as we have here, who have absolutely made a huge difference in um, accessing information accurately especially for the deaf, and especially in a large group like this. So my, my parents, their very own language, what they considered their own was sign language. When they talked to me directly, they used their voices and talked and signed at the same time. The reason for this is they were worried about me. They realized or they believed that I needed to have a lot of experience talking and hearing and learning through hearing uh, spoken, uh, spoken language and voices. So they always used their voices with me, but they always signed. And the reason for that was the whole principle of inclusion, including one another and including my brother. Um, about the time of my second birthday, we moved from the school to a house. And a few months later, so I was you know, somewhere between two and three, I really don't remember, but what I do remember was a sudden, one day, a sudden realization that nobody could hear me. Because now it's just the four of us. Before it was at the school with lots of people. Now it's just the four of us. And I was the only one that could hear my voice. So, I made a conscious decision not to use it anymore. So I mouthed as I, as I talked, and I used signs at the same time, and that was my habit with, with the deaf. This um, played out with really interesting <laughs> consequences when we were out 
among people who were not familiar with us and um, didn't know anything about being deaf. And because I didn't use my voice, everybody assumed I was deaf as well. So I heard lots of comments. And some of them were very demeaning and very judgmental comments, which were very upsetting to me. Um, I was most aware of that, coming, becoming aware of that when I was around six. And an example was we were out at a restaurant and lots of things were going on at the table next to us. And, you know, what's wrong with those people? Oh, they're deaf and dumb. Well, but why do they do that? Well, they're just not educated. And those kinds of, of descriptions were very upsetting to me. So I struggled. And one time, um, when I was struggling through this, I remember thinking, I will never let my parents know people say these things. I will protect them. <laughs> and <clears throat> several weeks later, I had another experience where a large family, we were out at the restaurant again, and a large family was seated at the table next to us. And they were particularly blatant in their comments. So I'm going through this internal struggle again, listening to them and trying to you know, not feel what I was feeling. And then all of a sudden, which I really can't explain, all of a sudden a calm came over me with the words in my mind. They they are this way because they've never had experience with deaf people before. They're, um, they just don't know better. And that was followed by the thought, I can't change them. Which was <clears throat> followed by the thought that time will increase understanding. It was amazing. And at that moment, <clears throat> I just let go and it never bothered me again. And this enabled, that letting go enabled me when we were leaving the restaurant, I went to their table and smiled and said, I sure hope you enjoy your meal. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at these words again, deaf and dumb. What about them? I, I still occasionally, you'll hear it occasionally. The only explanation I can find for that that I can imagine is that this has become an expression. And if a person uses it, it's because they've probably heard it in reference to people who are deaf and without thinking about what the words mean, they just repeat the pattern. But truly, these words are totally inappropriate and offensive. So we do away with them. Now, I came to Grinnell intending to major in Russian. And once I was here, I realized that my heart was really in teaching deaf children. And so I switched my major to American Studies as a background for teaching. And after graduation, went on to graduate school in speech and hearing with an emphasis on teaching the deaf. And then I taught for four years before we moved to Rochester, Minnesota. Now in Rochester, um, Mayo Clinic was one of the FDA sites, trial sites, for cochlear implantation. And it, this was around 1981. So in, the, in 1981, I received a call from the head of audiology at Mayo, who knew my background with my family and with teaching. And he said, we just implanted our first adult with a cochlear implant. I said, that's wonderful. He said, we need you to come down here and do auditory training with our implanted adults. I said, I don't know anything about cochlear implants. And he said, neither do we. So come, <laughs> join in with us, and we'll all learn together. And that's exactly what happened. Now, if you know anything about <clears throat> the controversies of education of the deaf, 
um, deaf culture versus world training and all of that, and medical intervention, you might question or wonder about my motives in making this decision to jump in with them. But I believed, because what I was doing was taking one foot and stepping into the world of medical intervention for the deaf, medical perspectives for the, of the deaf, while my other foot, which I call my family root foot, was still in the deaf cultural world. But I believed that I could um, manage, that I could balance, and that I could interweave all of these things. And even that maybe I could be um, of help to hearing professionals, helping them understand and maybe appreciate the realities that deaf people feel and have. So I, um, I for, from 1981 to 2011, I served and worked as the deaf education specialist, counselor, and counselor for three different cochlear implant programs associated with academic centers in three different states. And I started, of course, with Mayo Clinic, and I did the um, auditory training and counseling with their adult patients from 81 to 1990. In 1990, January, it, the FDA approved cochlear implant, implantation for children. And a lot of things changed. We were in Florida at the time, and I became immediately involved in, court, in setting up and coordinating a team of people to, do, to, to assess and make a decision about implantation because it was not... Um, we had the prerogative, no one had to be implanted. We had the prerogative of choosing those we would implant. And we were always worried about children that their parents have the correct perspective and expectation. And so I did that in Florida and again in Houston, Texas, until, until 2011. Now, those professional experiences, working first with adults and then with the children and their families, together with my uh, experiences growing up with the deaf, with my parents, with the uh, deaf culture world, have come together for me, come together confirming this perspective and um, and belief that I know I've always had that <clears throat> deaf is truly just a different reality than hearing. It's not less than, it's just different. It's equal to hearing. And so keep that in mind. As I was working with the children, um, I, there things that I would share with their parents to help them appreciate their children's abilities, is that um, those who are born deaf or lose their hearing very early in life develop abilities that we who are hearing will never have. And we, know, we all know that we have our basic senses. If we lose one, the others are heightened and become more acute. And particularly for the deaf, that would be the visual sense and augmented by the tactile sense. And so they're, they're very visually sensitive in ways that we are not, and also tactilely. So we had, I often had parents come in to counseling with me, and, they'd, and I'd been working with them, or all of the team had been working them, with them for quite a while, just doing all of the testing, and they would say, you know, we know with all this testing you say that our child is deaf, but we're really having a hard time believing this because every time we walk into his room or into his space, he turns and looks at us. And so I would smile and say, okay, think about this. You know what the testing is. You've seen all of it. Now think about the senses we have. What would clue your child 
into knowing that you've come into his face. And so generally, of course, they would say, oh, yes. Every time you open a door or close a door in a, to a room, air currents move in the room. Every time there's movement in the room, there is movement of air currents. We are oblivious. We who are hearing don't pay any attention to that. But those without hearing, and they have this heightened sensitivity, they feel it, and they respond. And it was really important to help parents understand that they had these abilities that were very unique, that they as parents didn't have. When I was a little girl, I remember <clears throat> watching my dad in a, he was playing in a basketball game on a deaf team against a hearing team. It was a championship game. And um, as he <clears throat> made the final winning throw, um, throw or winning basket, then everybody erupted and all the fans go out on the state, out on the floor, and I'm running out there too. I, I don't know, I was, I was younger than five. And I ran up to him, and what did I ask? How can you do that? How do you know where people are behind you? You're deaf. And then I realized I asked a really dumb question, and he was very kind and smiled and looked down at me, and he said, I feel them. So it's that kind of sensitivity that they use all the time that we are oblivious to. I also believe that those who are deaf um, have even a, a deeper sense of sensitivity. That we who are hearing in our sense of well-being and our sense of security at any moment in time is first dependent on hearing. We rely on our hearing for that security. You take that away, then what do you have? If you don't have hearing, then you rely on these tactile and visual senses to give you that sense of security. And I felt this was really important. I saw the results of talking with parents about it. It was very important to help them appreciate and understand that their children had unique abilities that we should support and, and, and indeed celebrate that deaf, being deaf or their, deaf, um, their lack of hearing was not something we should approach with an attitude of or um, a goal of fixing it. Now, um, there are major choices that people who, do, who are deaf have, just as all of us. We have major choices in our lives that affect the realities of the rest of our lives and our, our development, our progress, and our, our lifelong progress and development. For those who do not have hearing, one of those major choices is cochlear implantation. It is a medical option. Now, cochlear implants are an incredible tool, but that's what they are. They're a tool, but they are incredible. And over time, I have seen incredible progression in the development of these implants. And they are becoming more and more sophisticated in um, accessing sound in very refined and specific ways. Yet, success with a cochlear implant is dependent on, it's not push button, it's dependent on many, many, many experiences of listening, constantly listening with the implant, which means you're constantly wearing it, listening with the implant and making correct associations with experience, with whatever is going on at that moment, whether it's an object that you're dealing with or an activity or speech communication. So you have to have layer upon layer upon layer of experience listening and trying to make sense out of it. And that was critical in helping everyone who was implanted understand. They had to get over that it wasn't a push button miracle. Now, 
um, we hear with our brains. The implant circumvents that part of the ear that isn't working and goes directly to stimulate the hearing nerve that goes to the brain. So this, this experience that is needed is needed by the brain. The brain has to have ample opportunity to access sound and then make those correct associations over time and figure out what it means and then assimilate into speech production, into language recognition and language comprehension. Now, the, those who are signing and using sign language, who may have grown up with sign language or learned it along the way later, um, they identify wholly with the cultural aspect of being deaf. They choose American Sign Language, or ASL, as their cultural language, and they identify with those who do the same. American Sign Language is a complete and complex language. It's not an inferior copy <clears throat> of English. It has its own syntactical system, which is very different than English, and a very complex uh, what, uh, syntactical system, very complex vocabulary. And it's a beautiful language, as you can see. <clears throat> and um, those who choose this cultural choice, or choose the cultural avenue, then of course they're part of the deaf culture. And the deaf culture has become a, a a very um, proud and very vibrant entity, and it has an incredible history and um, many accomplished individuals who have come from that cultural realm. Um, this, the choices that they have, that, that those who are deaf face, is, is controversial sometimes and presents dilemmas to them along the way, some of them more than others. But there definitely are those choices, whether to go with the cultural identity and, and, and go with deaf culture, whether to access sound through a cochlear implant, whether to do both, that's another choice. But these choices present dilemmas. Now, Marlene Matlin, whom you may recognize as a very well-known deaf actress, recently produced a documentary called, um, oh, I'm deaf out, I missed, Deaf Out Loud. I hit the button, I'm sorry, Deaf Out Loud. And um, you, I don't have the icon here, but it is a beautiful uh, documentary which, um, presents three different families. And through these three different families, you can see the kinds of dilemmas that they face in making choices of what kind of, of the language, of schooling, education. Do they go with oral only, or do they go with the, simul with the simultaneous using sign language, as well as speech and language and lip reading training? They are very difficult, and you can see through their struggles how complex it is, and um, you can identify in many, with them in many of those cases. Along with Deaf Out Loud, is, uh, there are lots of different, I, I've heard of more, but I've only seen Switched at Birth, but Switched at Birth is a TV serial that it addresses um, these complex choices again, and the dilemmas that those who are deaf face in making choices. Do I get an implant or not? What will the deaf culture say? Those kinds of things. Um, another movie that's worth watching is wonderful. Uh, came from 2007. It was a documentary, award-winning, that was produced by I Irene Taylor Brodsky. It chronicles the decision of her deaf parents deaf since birth and or a few months of age to get a cochlear implant, to receive cochlear implants at age 65. 
They did it one week apart. So they went through this together. And it, it's a beautiful, uh, very sensitive portrayal of, of that process of assimilating to the realities of the cochlear implant and making sense out of the sounds that they receive. More importantly, it is a very important um, chronicling of the individual variation in that process because they both went through it in a different way. Um, there are many deaf people who have um, excelled in their lifetime, who have become, some of them very famous and, and others not so, but um, they've contributed tremendously to all the disciplines from art to science. And probably the most iconic of those is um, Helen Keller, who is pictured here, and who undoubtedly and, and, uh, it was a remarkable, brilliant woman. Deaf and blind, but she, in her many, in her several books that she offered, that she authored, she really shares with you her philosophies and her experiences of the reality of being deaf. My mother, when she was <clears throat> a young woman, met her and spoke with her in sign language, signing <clears throat> into her cupped hand a little bit, as you see here. And she says it was the most thrilling memorable experience <clears throat> of her life. A final thought. There is no template for <clears throat> being deaf, just as there's no template for being hearing. Each of us is unique. Our <clears throat> enduring challenge, then, is to continually seek to understand <clears throat> to appreciate and to uh, support one another in the choices that we make, our unique choices that make up our lives. Thank you.